What's up, YouTube? So today I want to follow up on my creation of my Bitwig live performance template. And yeah, this is probably going to be the last one dealing with in-the-box stuff. And in the next episode, I'll be discussing linking it up to the hardware and how I perform that side of things. So yeah, let's dive in and have a look. <laughs> So, so in this episode, I want to discuss uh, how I lay out the tracks, like the different tracks in the project, uh, transitioning between those tracks, how I deal with tempo, and what sort of time stretching modes and that kind of thing I choose for the clips. And then also want to go, and then I also want to go through the effects and a couple of ideas for performing the effects, and also just another neat feature called uh, Next Actions, which I believe is called Follow Actions in Ableton. So I went through a little bit about my color scheme uh, for the projects um, in the previous episode. Um, but just to you know go over things a little bit more, um, I kind of break things up into uh, stems. For example, four stems from the actual project file. And I've chopped these up into loops. And then I use the coloring uh, to kind of uh, show myself where different parts uh, in the track, like different scenes uh, and different kind of points of interest are in the track. So I can use this to kind of jump around um, on the launch pad, launch different clips, all sorts of stuff like that. Um, breaks and breakdowns, I'll generally make white so I can kind of easily see what's going on there. And then in between, for example, here, um, I've got, you know, the first track in the project uh, all laid out here. And then just below it, I've got the second track in the project. So to make things a little bit more visual on the controller, I'll put in these blank clips here and I'll color them something like purple so I can see where the end of the project is on the launch pad because there'll be obviously purple clips there. And this allows me to quickly transition to the next track without having to go to the computer to set anything up. I can literally just page down on the launch pad, look for where the purple stripe is and then I know, okay, this is now the start of the next project. So often I'll leave like a synth loop, for example, here. This, I mean, this whole stripe isn't purple, but it's because I want like a synth loop playing. I don't want it to ever go into like complete silence. Um, so I'll always just look for a place where there's like kind of two clips that are purple in a line. And that'll kind of usually remind myself, okay, that's where the end of the project is. Some of these clips I've left uh, different colors, but that's to remind myself for this tutorial, like things to do. Um, but generally speaking, I will use uh, yellow, orange, red, and white uh, in the actual tracks themselves uh, for the actual loops. And then other stuff uh, like purples and that kind of thing will be like reminders of things that are happening within the project. Okay, so let's chat a little bit about the effects. So just for this episode, I'm going to focus on the effects that are on the actual you know, audio tracks within the project. So you guys can obviously follow along. I'm going to split all the hardware stuff into a separate video because I know, you know, some of you guys will not be using the hardware. Some of you guys will probably just be using software um, and that kind of thing. So for this video, let's just dive into the different effects and how I set them up and use them on these different channels. So like I mentioned in the previous video, this plugin, Chris Glitch by Bombshanker Machines, is very, very cool. Um, it's basically like a automatic retrigger generator. And as you can see, I've put this on the kick and bass percussions and synth channel. I don't really put it on the sound effects because there's not much stuff happening there. And generally when I've kind of made it and generally when I've made it in the track, I kind of do chop it up and that kind of thing is there's already a lot of interest in the sound effects type stuff. So with that kind of thing, I'll generally just have like a filter or something or volume to control. So let me just give you a quick reference of what that plugin sounds like. So that's a nice way of like creating breaks where there aren't any or just, you know, creating interest on a synth or something or percussion line. And then what I generally do is I'll have um, on my MIDI controller, I'll have 
each of these channels um, I'll have assigned to a <clears throat> on my MIDI controller for each of these channels for the, the Chris Glitch plugin on each one I'll assign a MIDI control to automate this mix and then I actually just control it on the fly you know either mix in the amount of glitch that's happening on the kick and bass or the synths uh, and then I also have it on my live synth channel so I can play like a sound in from my Eurorack and glitch it up and stuff like that also got an instance of Snap Heap loaded up. I actually need to renew my license, as you guys can see. Um, but for this video, I mean, it's, I'm just going to show you guys how I've set it up so I don't actually need to edit these parameters. <laughs> I'm just being lazy. Anyway, so the reason I do my volume control here, as opposed to on the actual channel itself, is I want to have a maximum volume that I can quickly, you know, mix in and mix out. And this is cool to be able to, you know, slam the fader on a MIDI controller up to 100%. And, and it's, you know, you don't have this headroom that you might, you know, end up clipping with, which is a thing with the volume uh, on the actual channels. So on the MIDI controller, I don't mix these volumes here, if that makes sense. If I do need to do fine adjustments, I'll just go over to the mouse and I'll adjust it by hand. But I find the having the percentages just gives you the control to you know if for example you do need a bit more energy in the base you can turn down the other stuff um and i find then it makes you know overall over the sort of entire set you're not constantly turning these volumes up ever so slightly and ever so slightly you know you kind of set a maximum point that you stick to um so that's the reason why i use the volume automation here inside snap heap essentially i put a gain module on one of the buses set it to minus 30 and then use the volume to automate the mix of that bus then i've also got a filter over here and this is basically just a high pass filter that also does a bit of uh, mix on a reverb over here as well so as you automate the filter upwards it adds a little bit of reverb just to create a bit more interest than you know just a regular filter and i believe it's a similar thing on most of the channels uh, yeah, so the percussions, it's the same thing. Filter, reverb, and the volume automation. The synths, I've got a slightly different thing. So I've got a delay here as well. well. How I've set it up is, you know, the more filter you apply, the heavier it starts to mix in this delay and feedback. Uh, so let me show you uh, what that sounds like on the synths. So that stuff I'm obviously not doing with a mouse, I'm doing it on the MIDI controller. I've just assigned all these uh, parameters to different uh, knobs on the MIDI controller. And yeah, with the sound effects, same as the previous ones before the synths, so filter and reverb. Okay, so I want to discuss the audio algorithm uh, that I've chosen to generally use for my live sets. I found repitch is the, the least destructive. Of course, it pitches the sounds when you change the tempo. Um, but a lot of the other ones... You know, when you change the tempo, it's kind of tries to keep the pitch the same. So it does weird things to your waveform. So I generally find, um, I guess, you know, when you set the tempo, you know, if you're doing what I'm going to do in the following technique, then this probably won't matter. But generally speaking, you know, when you're transitioning from one clip to another, I generally find repitch is the, the least destructive. So... I generally, you know, once I've got all my clips loaded, I will just literally go to the top and bottom of my uh, project, select all of the clips and just make sure everything is on repitch. Um, I guess RAW will leave it untouched, but, you know, if you do want to do some shifting between tempos, um, then repitch is going to sound the least destructive, probably closest to something like a CDJ. The reason I like to keep my tempo the same as what I've written my tracks to is because let's say for example this track is in A sharp minor right and 
it's at 140 BPM. If we shift the BPM up ever so slightly, it's going to shift the pitch. So if we have a melody playing on a synth that's in A-sharp minor, it's not really going to correlate to the pitch of the track. So that's something to consider, and that's generally why I like to launch my clips at the tempo, what I've originally written them at, so I can have correlating uh, stuff on hardware and synths playing live alongside them. And one way of being able to automatically get uh, Bitwig to play the clip at, uh, or to launch a scene at the tempo that you want it to is to create a little master automation clip here. So in Ableton, it's a little bit easier. What you do is you just name the clip something like 140 BPM, I think it is. And then when you launch the clip, it'll automatically set the project tempo to 140 BPM. So the annoying thing about that is then you have to go and rename all the clips. Whereas, you know, with Bitwig, what you do is you just, you need to right click on the master channel and then say activate hybrid track. And what that's going to do is that's going to allow you to load automation clips into this master track over here. And what we can do then is just set the automation in the clip to 140 BPM. You want to make sure that you've got the transport tempo selected over here. And then you just copy the clip all the way down. And let's say, for example, here we've got a scene that we want to launch at 142 BPM. Then I've got a clip here where it launches at 142 BPM. So all you need to do then is just copy the clips down. You don't have to, you don't actually have to rename every single clip. Um, so let's say for example, you know, I've got my track here playing at 140 BPM and I don't necessarily want to launch it here. You know, say for example, in Ableton, you've only named the first section, like the first loops as 142 BPM, but you want to launch the project, you know, and you want to get straight going at this part then you're going to have to set your tempos and stuff manually. So it gets a little bit annoying. So what I do is I just make sure that on the master channel, I've got a correlating BPM uh, automation clip throughout the entire track's worth of project. And as you can see, as you go down here, every part of the master has some form of automation clip. So here it goes up to 143 BPM. I think here it goes up to 144 BPM. Okay, no, that's still 143. Here would be... 144 BPM. So that's one way of quickly being able to jump between these different BPMs, and it's pretty seamless. Um, you know, if you're going from, for example, uh, let me let me show you quickly. Okay, let's talk about next actions. So say for example, um, I've actually been caught by this section quite a few times when I'm looping it. Um, so how, I just wanna explain the section a little bit. So what it is, is it's like a, just after a break, the kick and bass comes in here. So for this first half of the loop, it's clean kick and bass with a bit of like atmospheric stuff. And then over here, the percussions come in. The problem is when this part loops a second time around, it kind of loses the momentum of that percussion coming in. Does that make sense? So if I'm not focusing 100% on the sort of, uh, how can I say, the pro progression of what's happening here, I can, you know, destroy that momentum by just forgetting to trigger the next clip. Uh, let me show you guys a quick example of what happens when you loop this.
So we kind of lose that momentum there. And one way of being able to, you know, automate these types of maneuvers, you know, to move to the next clip without having to trigger it is a thing called next actions or in Ableton, I believe it's called follow actions. So let's select all of these four clips. I made them blue so I can remind myself to come back here um, to fix this. So over here on our uh, inspector panel at the bottom here, we've got this next actions. So how this works is you set the amount of time before it does the thing. So after and do. After is the amount of time and do is the thing that it does. So let's say, for example, after one bar, and I think that's beats, this would be bar. Yeah. After, uh, let's just say four bars, let's play next clip. Let's try this out. So that works, but it's uh, after four bars and we've chosen to cut our tracks into bars of 16, I believe. So we'll have to just go here and adjust this to 16 and then it should line up automatically. And then this part will loop because we haven't set a follow action. So this is a cool way of being able to automatically play through a multi-track arrangement that you've got like this. Um, that being said is I like control over when it changes from the major parts into the next major parts. But next actions is just a very cool way of being able to automate these little tricky parts where you may have that kind of loss of momentum. Awesome. I think that pretty much covers everything I wanted to get through in this video. Let me know if you've got any more questions. Just put them in the comments. A big thanks to IDM Mag, proud supporters of the dance music scene and my channel. As always, if you like this video, hit that like button, hit that subscribe button, and see you guys next time.